This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Two thousand years ago, Greek, Roman, and Persian merchants sailed down India's west coast to an area now called Kerala. Searching for cargoes of precious goods, they followed trade routes that were already more than a thousand years old, dating to times older than the biblical King Solomon's. Ancient stories spoke of distant Ophir, a faraway land of elephants and apes, a land of exotic gods. Over several millennia, Kerala was the trade destination for many peoples, and some of them stayed. For centuries, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Hindus have lived harmoniously in this sunny land. I'm Bruce Craig. I'm a professor who studies the history of food and cultures. And that means exploring the peoples and places from which they come. Kerala lies not far north of the equator with a coastline along the Arabian Sea. Some 30 million people live in a space about the size of the state of Massachusetts. Kerala became one of India's states in 1956 when several ancient independent regions were joined together. The names Malabar, Cochin, Travancore sound as if they came straight from the Arabian Nights. Our journey began near the city of Calicut, an original destination for a rather famous European explorer. Here's a place that Christopher Columbus actually thought he'd landed, India's Malabar coast. But he was wrong. He never got here. His great commercial rival, the Portuguese Vasco da Gama, did in 1498. Now, the merchant explorers were not out just for the love of it. They were out to get rich. This is what would have made them rich, pepper. It was so valuable that it was called black gold. And warehouses like this are very much the same as they were in the time of Vasco da Gama. Today, black pepper is so common that we hardly think about it. For several thousand years, however, pepper drove the European search for a sea route to the Indies. Only the richest of elites could afford Kerala's pepper. That's why Greek, Roman, Chinese, and later Portuguese merchants established trade routes to South India, where it grew. The Chinese and Portuguese became so greedy that they planted pepper in other parts of Asia. They produced so much pepper that they destroyed their own high-priced markets. So prices fell, and today, everyone can get pepper, cheaply. Pepper is the berry of a parasitic vine that climbs on trees. However, the vine is benign and won't kill its host. Black, white, and green pepper are the same berry. Their colors and intensity of flavor depend on how they're processed. The most common black pepper is the ripe berry that's been dried in the sun. Milder white pepper is the berry with the husk removed, and green pepper is simply the unripe pepper berry. Pepper has to be harvested the moment it's ripe because birds love to eat the berries while they're on the vine. Once picked, the berries are carefully processed. Just a few miles to the east, the land rises into low mountains, the Western Ghats, 
known here as the Cardamon Hills. Hidden in the hills are still ponds and lakes. It's here that Kerala's wildlife sanctuaries are located. Spice plantations are scattered across these hilly regions. K.T. Matthew took me on a tour of his plantation where cardamom has grown for generations. We walked in the shade of tall cardamom plants. Matthew also grows cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, turmeric, pepper, and ginger. Well, you do grow, well, you said you grow a small amount of ginger. Yeah. I think we have some ginger growing just down here. I think this is ginger. Wow. 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 Oh. oh. Oh, oh, well, it smells earthy, but it smells. Look at the beautiful, fine skin on it. Oh, is this beautiful. Wow, 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 wow. This is gorgeous ginger. Cardamom, ginger, and turmeric all belong to the same botanical family, the Zingaberacea. All are native to India's tropical lands, and they are three critical ingredients of India's classic sauces. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's very different. Turmeric has its own distinct flavor but not as pungent and hot as raw ginger. Very different. It's also used as cloth dye for the robes of Buddhist monks when the traditional and more costly saffron isn't available. Pardon? Do you have any long pepper growing anywhere? Long pepper? Well, what exactly do you mean by long pepper? Well, they come in either long pods or long strings. They don't, you don't use them. I know they just grow wild now. But you haven't seen anything like that? No. Okay. These are what you call your tillers. So every year you have new tillers coming up, mm -hmm. and then you have, these are the panicles on which the cardamom grows. And uh, what they normally do is we harvest it once every month. Mm -hmm. It takes about, so every t um, 21 days you have people come and pick cardamom from these plants. How do you know when it's ripe? See, when they are ripe, they normally, the seeds turn black. See? So this is a fully matured one, and this, uh, Immature one. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say you can't have Indian food without cardamom, but then cardamom does play an important, it's, it's a major ingredient in most Indian food. Right. Cardamom harvesting is a skill developed over time. Harvesters can tell if pods are ready by touch alone. The price of cardamom depends on the size of the capsule. The larger the pod, the more money it brings. Color is also important. Deep green means the strongest flavor. After washing, the pods are taken to wood-burning ovens where they're dried and sifted. More than half of Kerala's cardamom crop travels halfway around the world to Sweden, where it's used in baking the famous limpa bread. Spices made Kerala's economy and helped shape its culture. For more than a thousand years, Kerala's rulers invited people of all religions to trade and to settle. Jews were among the first to come to Kerala. Some migrated along the spice trade routes to escape from Roman oppression in the 70s. A strong Jewish community remained in the city of Cochin until the foundation of Israel in 1948 drew away much of its population.
Today, very few Karolite Jews are left, but their old quarter still attracts Jewish visitors from around the world. It's said that Christians first arrived in central Kerala, the old kingdom of Travancore, in about the year 50 with the Apostle St. Thomas. Several varieties of Christians followed over the centuries, adopting their celebrations, art, and architecture to a unique South Indian vernacular. St. Mary's Valiapali Church is the oldest Syrian church in this part of Travancore being the seat of an ancient monument, the so-called Persian cross, and the Pahlavi inscriptions. I'm reading from a description of this church by the vicar, written about 100 years ago. By that time, the church was already 350 years old, and the cross behind me, almost 1,000. St. Mary's is a Syrian Orthodox church, whose founders came via Persia. Like everything else that comes to India, Christianity received an Indian interpretation. The iconography is in the Baroque European style, but executed by Indian artisans who interpreted biblical scenes through the lens of Hindu artistic traditions. Kerala's Christians represent about 20% of the population. They're divided into several branches, Catholics, Orthodox, Syriac, and Protestants being the major groups. Near the city of Cochin, we joined a Christian wedding celebration. The bride wore the distinctive Kerala cream and gold sari. After the ceremony, the couple visited the tomb of the groom's father. Indians of all religions have certain rules of public behavior. You very rarely see a man and woman holding hands in public, even if they are husband and wife. But it's very common to see men holding hands with their best friends. From across the Arabian Sea, the spice trade brought another of Kerala's major religious groups, Muslims. Islam was brought to South India in the 9th century from Arabia and Persia. The ancient tales of Sinbad the Sailor are set in the Arabian Sea at just the same time period. Muslim merchants, called Mapilas, married local women and settled along the Malabar coast, now the northern part of Kerala. In the 16th century, more Muslims were invited by local Hindu rulers to form a navy. That was to protect the spice trade from the Portuguese. Piracy became so routine and profitable that others joined in. One pirate was the infamous Captain William Kidd. This Englishman began his career by capturing a Muslim spice ship off the Malabar coast. Today, Mapilas are still connected to the sea. They're fishermen and boat builders and comprise about 20% of the population. The oldest mosque in India is located just south of the city of Calicut. The quarter moon and star on a field of green is the symbol of Islam. Most mosques have similar features, based on the graceful lines of classic Arabic architecture. Onion-shaped cupolas are common, 
and tall minarets are places from which a muezzin calls the faithful to prayer. At one famous mosque, devout Muslims toss money as they pass by. The money is used for charity, schools, hospitals, and for the poor. Charity is an obligation for all Muslims. The faithful are called to pray five times each day, and before entering a mosque, worshipers must cleanse themselves. Muslim men and women pray separately, though prayers can be offered anywhere. In the home of the mother family, the family's women face Mecca and offer their prayers. Most of the young women are orphans taken in by the mothers, and they've become part of their extended family. Charity is one of the five pillars of the Islamic faith, professing absolute faith in Allah, prayer, pilgrimage to Mecca, and fasting during the holy month of Ramadan are the others. One way that Muslims distinguish themselves from other Keralites is by their food. The mother family women are preparing a meal. They're rolling out rice flour patris. These little pancakes cooked over a simple wood fire originated in North India, where historically, Muslims have been a large part of the population. So North Indian dishes are often associated with Muslim cuisine. Coconut is one of the signature ingredients in Kerala dishes. In fact, the name Kerala is said to mean land of coconuts. The fiber surrounding the coconut's kernel is called core, and it's used worldwide for making rope and fiber mats. Core is a Kerala word meaning tangled or knotted. Coconut milk is a main component of sauces and stews. It's made by grinding the nut meat and mixing it with water to form a liquid rich in oil and cholesterol. One technology the spice trade seems not to have brought to India is the cutting board. No matter what the culinary style, spice mixtures are used in almost every dish. Curry is the name usually given to them, but the word comes from a South Indian word meaning simply sauce. Traditional Indian cooks don't use a single generic curry powder. Spice mixtures differ widely from region to region and cook to cook. Samosas, deep fried dough triangles filled with spiced fillings are also northern in style. Here, they're cooked in a kawali. These pans probably originated in India. They were brought to China about 2,000 years ago, and Chinese cooking has not been the same since. In the Cantonese language of South China, they're called woks. 
The Mother Kitchen is a fascinating mixture of the old and the new. Wood-fired cooking pits and gas stoves coexist with food processors and mortars and pestles. Though labor-intensive, upma, or pounded rice, has a flavor and texture that surpasses anything made by modern machines. And in South India, whatever a family's religious background, there's no meal without rice. This vast sea of green is a rice paddy. We're in Kerala's rice bowl. Rice is absolutely central to Keralite cuisine. They eat it for breakfast, they eat it for lunch, and they eat it for dinner. In fact, they eat about a pound per person per day. Kerala's tropical climate and rich coastal lands allow for multiple rice crops. Where one area is green with growing rice, another is ready for harvest. Rice comes in two main varieties, short grain japonica and long grain indica. Each has hundreds, thousands of variations. Naturally, Keralites grow indica. About 30% of Kerala's land is devoted to paddy rice, but the yields cannot match the demand, so the state still has to import rice from neighboring regions. Once the dried rice is harvested, it has to be separated from the stalks. Winnowing is done by beating them on specially shaped stones. When shaken from the stalks, the rice grains have to be sifted again and again. The wind blows away the remaining chaff, and the technique hasn't changed in the past 5,000 years. Cooking the rice has. Now the freshly harvested rice is parboiled, which removes just the tough outer shell, leaving six vitamin-rich layers. Kerala's rice bowl is the central part of the state. Flooded paddies are scattered across the land and fed by a vast network of rivers and canals. Called the backwaters, they support a unique way of life. These waterways link villages and towns up and down the coast to each other and to the Arabian Sea. The Baipali River and many canals are the life artery of the state. Some of them are broad with little population. Others are more intimate, a kind of South Indian Venice. You can't get anywhere without a boat. And if there's no bridge, a boat will get you across the river as well as down it. The backwaters consist of 44 rivers, 41 flowing west to the Arabian Sea, plus many branches and tributaries.
Life along the waterways might look serene, but not always, because four or five times a year, villagers go forth to do battle in snake boats. Centuries ago, boats like these were used in naval warfare, but now they're used in competitive sports. Races are held during festivals. The most celebrated and with the largest boats is a harvest festival called Onam. Villagers train for months to coordinate their rowing skills. The main steersman has a special long oar that sets the speed and balances the boat. A single stroke of the great oar can push the boat up to 30 feet forward. To make them even faster, the boats are slicked with oil. Leaving the excitement of the races behind, we're ready for a home-cooked meal. We've been invited to the home of our guide and translator, Biju. His mother, Garajmani, is a school teacher in the district, and like other Indian mothers, a very good cook. Spices are always freshly ground on a stone. This one is turmeric mixed with a fresh grated coconut. She cooks everything over a simple stove fired by tree branches. The pans are thin-bodied so that everything cooks quickly. Meals in South India are served on banana leaves, as all meals were before the arrival of Western dinner plates. This is a very good combination. Yeah. A thin, crispy pancake called papadum is crunched up into a heap of rice for texture. Oh, it's nice and warm. Yeah, it you see, please. And then you make a ball out of this? Yeah. Ever the attentive guide, Biju showed us how to eat. And <coughs> oh, that's how you do it? Yeah. All right. Here's a little ball. Okay. How's that? Is that? Yeah. yeah. It's got to be firmer, right? You want to do it with you your some and and yeah. Not pressing too much. Each banana leaf has okay. several helpings of pickled condiments. There's a little ginger pickle. Yeah. yeah. And you can take whatever you like from this. Uh, are we allowed to lick our fingers? Yeah. Like that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like this right. and, and folding this thing here and we'll put the glass here. Biju and his family are Hindus. In his bedroom, as in many Hindu homes, there's a small altar dedicated to gods and saints. Many homes also have pictures of one of Kerala's most venerated leaders, Sri Narayan Guru. Shrines dedicated to him are scattered throughout the state, especially at schools. The word guru means spiritual or philosophical teacher. About 150 years ago, Narayun began social and educational reform movements. His schools began the process of educating all Keralites, regardless of social position or caste. Virtually all children go to school. Kerala has the highest literacy rate in India, more than 90%. Schools are run by the state and by various religious groups. The language used is Kerala's native tongue, Malayalam. It's one of India's 17 official languages and one of the most difficult to master. The alphabet alone has 53 characters. Students also learn Hindi, India's official language 
and English, the second language of all South India. Education always changes people's lives for the better. Studies show that the quality of the average person's life is better in Kerala than anywhere else in India, Africa, and most of Asia. Infant mortality rates are low, and life expectancy is about the same as in the United States. Sri Narayan Guru did much to uplift the lower castes. His famous motto was, one caste, one religion, one God for all men. Caste, or Varna, is an ancient system in which one is born into a social position. Under it, everyone is assigned to certain roles. Some castes might be priests, some warriors, others workers in traditional jobs. And some are not in castes at all. They were the untouchables, historically relegated to the most menial and unclean work. Actually, it's hard to find an untouchable in Kerala because the caste system has been so eroded. People remember what caste they came from once upon a time in the same way that they remember their family histories. In Kerala, education, land reforms, and breakup of merchant power has made Kerala the most egalitarian state in India. It also happens to be a state where women often have equal or greater power than men. Keralites' demand for social equality has also led them to vote for communist candidates. For years, these were the world's only freely elected communist governments. The caste system has always been identified with a Hindu religion, and the majority of Keralites are Hindu, about 60% of the population. It's a polytheistic faith and is probably the world's oldest continuing religion. Underlying the whole system is a concept of one universal power. It is often thought of as a kind of trinity. Vishnu the sustainer, Brahma the creator, and Shiva the destroyer and restorer. Worshippers are on their way to the famous Shabri Mala temple dedicated to the god Vishnu. Pilgrims have come from across South India in vehicles decorated with portable shrines and flowers. Their facial paint and black clothes show religious devotion and that means 41 days of discipline. No meat, no alcoholic drinks, and sexual abstinence. Even small children are made up to resemble gods. This one, the handsome young Shiva. The forehead spot represents the god's third eye, the access point to his spiritual center. Hinduism is a complex religion that has over 330 million gods, or devas. Devas personify everything in the universe. The gods can be good or evil, and they can have many different incarnations. No matter what, all beings, human and divine, are subject to the laws of karma or destiny. In Hindu tradition, that means cycles of birth, death, and rebirth each one of which brings one closer to their ultimate destiny. Temples are usually dedicated to one of the major gods, though many other gods may be depicted. Saraswati is the goddess of wisdom. Narasimha, the man-lion who slays a terrible demon, is one of Vishnu's ten incarnations. Ganesha is the elephant-headed god. He's often accompanied by his wife and a rat. The rat is his vehicle, that is, when he travels, it's on the rat's back. In fact, all gods have some form of vehicle. Prayers offered to Ganesha can bring good fortune because he's thought to remove all obstacles. Coconuts are smashed open. 
the delectable meat offered to Ganesha because Hindu beliefs say that he's a jolly fellow who loves to eat. In return, perhaps he will grant worshippers their wishes. Prayers for good fortune are always important when people embark on the uncharted seas of matrimony. At a Hindu wedding, the priest who performs the ceremony prepares the altar. His arm markings and the band over his shoulder indicate his caste. He's a Brahmin, the highest of the four traditional castes. Sandalwood paste is made for the priest for use in the ceremony. The coconut has deep symbolic meaning for Hindus. Its two outer layers, the shell and the tangled core, represent worldly things. Removing the last outer fiber frees the kernel and symbolically means spiritual perfection. Like many marriages in India, this one has been arranged by family elders. Spouses are often found through newspaper advertisements, and marriages aren't set unless the individual horoscopes are compatible. The ads always say, send photo and horoscope. Thus are the seas of marriage charted. While preparations are being made in front, a banquet is being prepared in the back for several hundred guests. Huge brass vessels are set over open fires and carefully tended by the caterers. Among the dishes are steamed soured rice cakes called idlis, avial, a vegetable stew, and cauldrons of rice. Dessert is payasam, a kind of sweet, thin rice gruel. In Hindu tradition, the husband is considered to be a guru to his wife, but to him, she's a goddess, especially in Kerala. Men and women eat separately, and unlike Western meals where conversation goes on, Indian meals are serious eating events. The traditional banana leaf plate makes for quick cleanup because a second seating of 250 serious diners will soon follow. And there are no toasts at this wedding banquet. Instead, while the guests gorge, the bride and groom are blessed by family members. In older days, a wedding might have been celebrated with a performance of Kathakali. Meaning literally story dance, it's a classical theatrical entertainment unique to Kerala. Kathakali combines dance, singing, makeup, costume, and gestures into a refined storytelling art form. It takes years of rigorous training to learn to perform these plays. At Kerala's most famous Katakali Academy, young men are taught their ancient art. Katakali incorporates some 800 hand and body gestures to form a special dramatic language. The actor's face carries the character's emotions, all expressed through extraordinary control of the facial muscles. There are eight basic expressions, such as fear, disgust, anger, happiness, and sadness. Makeup is an elaborate process. Young men practice on the bottoms of bowls to perfect their craft. Costume and makeup training take three years, and performance training is another three years.
graduates enter professional dance companies which perform all over the state, from village celebrations to major cultural festivals. One dancer applies a betel seed to his eyes to make them red. He'll be an angry character. Katakali dramas are based on classical literature, especially the epic poems the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. All the performers are male. They play both men and women. Each character's makeup and gestures tell us what he or she is. Green means a person of great honor, a god or a hero. The actors never speak. Their dance is accompanied by musicians and singers who tell the story. Performances always begin at night and can run up to three days of continuous action. Katakali is one of the hidden treasures of Kerala. Kerala has many other kinds of dance and music forms. At the annual Elephant Parade Festival, held each January, varieties of local dance, music, and religious traditions are brought together. In India, most festivals evolve from religious celebrations. And in Hindu temple festivities, at least one elephant is a traditional participant. Ritual music called Chenda Milam is performed at major festivals. The oboe-shaped kuzal and trumpet-like kambu rise over drums and cymbals in imitation of elephants' trumpetings and tigers' roars. The Great Elephant Parade is a somewhat misleading description because the elephants never move. As hundreds of spectators look on, a select few are permitted to touch and feed them, and in so doing, gain great good luck from this most fortunate of animals. Tayams are important religious dances performed as kinds of prayers. Here, the great goddess Chamundi appears with her consort. Tiger or Puli dance comes from villages in the hill country where the great Bengal tigers once roamed freely. They are just one of many folk dances that were performed in villages all over Kerala. Just as festivals carry on Kerala's cultural traditions, so do food markets. <laughs> In a roadside market, characteristic South Indian foods appear. Preserved fish, dried and salted since there's no refrigeration in most villages, and jackfruit. <laughs> If you come to a food market in South India, you're sure to find tomatoes, chilies, potatoes, and even avocados. 
Well, they're not native to India. In fact, they're the other side of the Portuguese spice trade. These products come from Mexico, and they were brought here by those merchants who were seeking spices but brought other foods with them. Kerala was one of the first places where the globalization of food began because everyone wanted South India's spices. In exchange, new foods were brought to India. Chilies have now replaced black pepper. Most samosas are filled with potato, a native of Peru. But some things are better left in their native land. All through South India, you'll find people chewing on something, and it's not gum. Arica nuts, called betel, are what's being munched. Betel is a species of palm tree that's cultivated specifically for its nuts. When the nut is wrapped in the leaf of another kind of palm, the result is a famous Indian treat called pan, or pan parai. You can find pan vendors on the streets and in local markets. Thank you. Okay. The betel nut shell is often tough to crack. Okay, that's probably enough. The leaf is cleaned of any growths and a paste made of calcium chloride is applied. In northern countries, calcium chloride is used to melt snow and ice on streets and roads. Betel is a mild narcotic and it's also used to get rid of intestinal worms. After passing through five pairs of helping hands, the pond was ready to try. And like any culture, the natives are curious about visitors' reactions to their distinctive foods. Pan is an acquired taste. It's also an acquired color on your teeth, deep red. When most Westerners think about India, Great Britain also comes to mind. For more than a hundred years, India was the jewel in the imperial British crown. The British brought their own architecture, legal system, language, and basic transportation. India is the world's largest democracy, and it's largely based on the British parliamentary system. India, in turn, greatly influenced the British way of life through a beverage. If you think all the tea in the world comes from China, you're wrong. Much of it comes from India. In fact, India is where tea originated. The Western Ghat Mountains are covered in tea plants, and they produce an extremely high-quality product. Tea originated in northern India, and that's still the world's best. The demand for tea was so great that it was planted in Kerala by British companies mostly in the 20th century. The tea cutters come mostly from the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu. They cut only the pico, the tender leaves around the plant's buds. The orange pico designation on most of the tea we buy in stores does not mean a variety. It just means the top of the tea plants that were processed and sold by Dutch merchants, orange being the Dutch national color.
rubber trees are another British import brought by plantation owners to South India from South America. The harvesting technique is the same in both places. Diagonal cuts in the rubber tree bark free the tree's sap. It's tapped twice a day. When the spiral cuttings reach the ground, the tree is allowed to grow a new layer of bark. Then the tapping process is started again. Rubber is one of those products that changed human history. Used from tires to pencil erasers to bubble gum, the impact has been immense. The collected tree sap is diluted with water. Then acid is added so that the sap coagulates into something called latex. The raw latex has a unique odor, something like an open sewer. Then the rubber is processed into sheets and air dried, either by hanging or laid out on the hot pavement. Not all of Kerala's visitors and influences came from the west. The Arabian Sea is a highway to the east as well. Along the coast near Cochin, the skyline is punctuated by high, dramatically curved fishing nets. They're evidence of Chinese merchants who first reached these shores over 2,000 years ago. They're very similar to nets found in Southeast Asia. Scenic though they are, the nets aren't very practical today because the area bay has become overfished. It's often said that India is a land of contrasts, that the traditional and the new exist side by side. That's certainly true for Kerala, where the basics remain in a rapidly modernizing world. Vasco da Gama and his Portuguese colleagues got what they came for. 500 years ago, they established this trading port. Now, Vasco might not recognize the freighters behind me, but he'd certainly know their cargoes. Cardamom, ginger, and pepper. Still, the wealth of the Indies. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.